we are living in a time of dramatic changes first google and amazon then facebook and now many more like tesla and airbnb or dismantling long established industries at times like this enterprises need transformational leaders who have the courage to steer the company in a new direction at anupartha we are exclusively focused on helping our clients discover and hire transformational leaders This video series brings you conversations with exceptional leaders across the globe to learn what makes them do what they do and how to drive change at scale. As the first CEO of Arm, Robin unleashed a new way of doing business in the chip world that went on to shake and dethrone Intel as the undisputed king of the processor world. Where did he get the inspiration to challenge the existing world order sitting inside a tiny company in Cambridge, England? How did he disrupt a model that did not look broken? In this rare in-depth interview of Sir Robin Saxby, we delve into the thinking process that results in such disruptive companies like Arm. So when we're born, we're born in an environment. I was lucky. I was born in the West, and there was money and there was food. Some people are less lucky than me. Um, but I was born to a poor family in that it was just after the war. And my dad says I would have been born five years earlier if there hadn't been the war. So he came back from the war, and then I came along. I've always had this interest in technology for some reason, and I can remember when I was about three years old, we were on holiday, and I, there was a telephone exchange, and I'd wandered into the telephone exchange to see how it works. And my mother got a, and father got a phone call saying, "Will you please come and find your son, who's in this telephone exchange?" So there I was. Then I can remember when I was about five, my mum would go shopping. I'd be looking at the jointers, digging up roads and playing with wires, and that was far more interesting than shopping. At the age of eight, I got an electrical outfit for a Christmas present, which was actually. Pivotal for me because I would go to optional lessons at school with the electrical outfit. It had bells, buzzers, and things like that, and I'd wire up the circuits. And my teacher would say, "Be careful, you don't electrocute yourself." And I said, "It's only four and a half volts." So she didn't realise you couldn't get electrocuted with four and a half volts, but I did. I kind of understood Ohm's law when I was about eight, and then when I was thirteen, I had a radio and TV repair business. Pivotal moment. I, I actually say I was inspired by somebody who died. So next door there was a guy called Mr. Birch who died. I got his book called The Modern Manual of Radio and all of his electronic components, and I read the book and built the circuits. So if Mr. Birch hadn't died, I wouldn't have access to the valves and buzzers and things, and I wouldn't have done the books, and I wouldn't have built the circuits. I wouldn't have read the book. Next thing that happened before pirate radio was invented, I had my own pirate radio station because I, I love rock and roll. Love music. That's the reason why I chose Liverpool University was because the Beatles came from there, and I had all my music. I loved blues and I loved jazz, and I had a reel-to-reel -reel tape recorder. And what was transmitted on the radio, I didn't really like the music, so I built a little transmitter. It was in a shed down the garden, and I walked around with my own transistor radio set. In those days, it was germanium transistors, not silicon. And I had a friend down the road who did, did the same. We used to communicate via radio. This is about thirteen. And I, I, I can remember vividly walking along, listening to my own music from my reel-to-reel -reel tape recorder, and outside my house was a post office detector van, and I was transmitting illegally. So I rushed in and switched everything off. Okay, and so this is my story. Now, school teachers are very important. So at school, I wasn't the most academic student, but I was pretty good practically. We had a physics master. His name was Jenkins. We had to do build things at home, and he said, "Right, we'd have a lecture, and then go and build something that shows what you've learned." I won a prize of two shillings and sixpence for the best thing built at home. That came from me, a guy called Higgins. I was eleven when I won that prize, and then Jenkins, when I was building stuff at home, he would give me twenty-three out of twenty for my practical work. 
which meant that I could still be top of the physics class even when I didn't do the best in, in the exams. And then radio and TV repair business. I learned the importance of customer service when I was 13. I did a repair at Christmas uh, for one of my dad's friends. And in those days, the Queen's speech was the thing that everybody had to watch. This guy had a broken television. I fixed it so he could watch the Queen's speech and he gave me double the money. And I appreciated the value of customer service. So then going back to my university career, so I built amplifiers. Uh, we had uh, blues clubs. I was the roadie building stuff and playing. And by the way, there's some a lot of fun there, some nice ladies around and things like that. We like that as well, you know. And we had best music, best parties, best girls, best rock and roll, all courtesy of a bit of technology. So I then thought, what do I want to study? So I was good at physics, thought electronic engineering, because that's connected to my radios and tellies. That seems like a good idea. Where's a fun city to go and live? I was born in a small place. Liverpool was a co on the coast. It was rock and roll. I wanted to go to Liverpool. That was my first university. Went there, met my wife, got married. By the way, we celebrate our 45th wedding anniversary this year and all this other good stuff. I've got a friend who has got a broken telly. Do you think you can fix it? I said, sure. I went to work in an electrical store selling components and I went as 15, I got paid seven shillings and sixpence on a Saturday for working a whole day and I cycled five miles both ways. And the reason why I did that is because I worked for him, I got the components at trade prices so I could make more margin. The big margin was putting a new cathode ray tube in the, um, in the televisions and that was a big margin item. So I, but, 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 but what I'm actually saying is I didn't suddenly wake up one day and think I've got these big ideas. My dad had got an opportunity, this guy, I just, I just grabbed the opportunity. And there was no magic or cleverness about it all, it just happened. And what, I, what you do need is perseverance. So I cycled five, five miles each way, up a lot of hills, two and seven ceilings and six, but so I guess I was hungry and I was driven. The ARM architecture was invented inside Acorn Computers, which was a British company. And this, there was a team of engineers that did that, and they got the first working ARM chip, and that was used for the Acorn Archimedes computer. VLSI Technology, semiconductor company, built those chips for Acorn. They were based in Silicon Valley. VLSI had an arrangement with Acorn that if they got other people interested in this ARM technology, they could sell it to them. VLSI technology got Apple interested in this technology and Larry Tesla, who's now a good friend of mine, who was the chief scientist of Apple at the time, he wanted to use this ARM technology for uh, the Newton project. And he, but he said to VLSI technology, I cannot build, I cannot buy a chip that's owned by a competitor, because they were competitors. And VLSI said, they are thinking of spinning it out. And Apple, the venture side of Apple, said, well, we're prepared to put some money into a spin-out, but before we're prepared to put the money on the table, you've got to find a CEO. So I got a headhunting phone call from Hydric and Struggles about, got this idea of a spin-out, come and have a meeting, come and have a chat. I happened to know the Acorn people. I knew Herman Hauser, who, who was at that time a non-exec of Acorn, but he'd been, he was the guy who started, funded, the original ARM project. So I go along for a meeting, first of all with the headhunter, but then with Acorn and Apple, Larry Tesla and some other people. And the question was, thinking of spinning this out, do you think it can work? Uh, what do you think we should do? And I said, well, this is back in 1990. I said, silicon is like steel, it's a commodity. The last thing we should do is build chips. I actually said we should build chips over my dead body. Mike Muller, who is still today's CTO said, now there's an opportunity, I'm still alive. Uh, ARM doesn't majorly build chips. So the interview was about the business model, designing, licensing, and how could that work. And because I had a background from semiconductors, because I'd been through the previous startup I'd been involved in, ES2, it hadn't worked out, I'd got some experience. So, and by the time I was offered the job and I accepted the job, we'd worked out what we wanted to do. So 
Acorn, because Acorn as a business was struggling to stay alive, they got this cost base of this R&D, they couldn't keep, afford to keep inventing it, they needed more income. So, so they had a draft plan idea to spin the company out and there was a draft business plan on how they might do that. And that was the starting point uh, for me to look at. But the reality of that business plan it was unrealistic. So it said Acorn will build all these chips, uh, buy all these chips, Apple will buy all these chips. And I thought, no chance, we've got to get revenue from somewhere else. So they wanted to spin it out. They had a draft idea on how to do that. Uh, the key guy who'd done most of the work on this was a guy called Malcolm Bird. And it was with him I was discussing this and we were iterating and evolving. When Acorn, Apple were interviewing me for this job. I was president of US2, as well as doing some other things in Europe, which was this startup. And what I'd had to do there was cut the cost. So basically, they had this great dream, this great vision, and all startups always need more money than you think. So the over dead body thing was well, I've, in Silicon Valley, I've just laid off half the people because it was too difficult because the dream was too great it was absolutely impossible with this one i want to start a real vision that we have a chance of, uh, of achieving so for arm to compete with only 1.5 million pounds of seed capital to compete with intel or at&t or whatever with hundreds of millions of pounds or dollars there was absolutely no way we were ever going to do that so it was so it would be totally stupid to think you should make chips. Now, by the way, the original business plan also said that they had drafted was hire a VP of marketing, hire a, do, do all this, uh, go, uh, go and raise some more money. And it was all complete nonsense because until you've got a business plan with a vision and a plan that you think you can achieve, forget it, get real. So again, part of my thinking, this is the advice I give to a lot of startups, think beyond the possible and then back off to reality. So I had already thought we can be the global risk standard. The way to get that out there, we've got a license. Everybody, everybody's got to use it to create a standard. You've got to do it in parallel. If you do it in series, you build a factory, you do this, you're never going to do it. So it starts from the vision and then come back to the detail of how you do it. So what I'm really saying is the idea of building chips, because I'd spent, I'd also in the semiconductor industry, I'd worked for Motorola from 1973 to 84. In the time with Motorola, I think I'd seen four downturns of the silicon industry. So and what happens is it's boom to bust. So what happens is when there's huge demand, the chip prices go up, you make a fortune. As soon as that demand goes away, the chip prices fall and you're, you're, you're selling them below cost. So that, that's where the yeah, over my dead body comes from. I've been through enough pain already. I don't need to do it again. Thank you. So the truth is, is this, this is cool. It's, this is amazing about how these stories come about. So what actually happened is this. So the nice thing about, oh, this is another thing that happened is, so Acorn had, they, Acorn had found this building for the new company on, and it was at Vision Park, and it was a lovely concrete building, and it was beautiful, and I'm the new CEO, and they've got the building all lined up. And I said, don't like that building. It's too expensive, and it's got the wrong personality. You can't afford it got to find another building. So Malcolm Bird, who's running the team before I come along with an Acorn, not too pleased that I don't like his building, but we have a nice chat and he finds one of his guys to go and find me another building and we'll go and have a look. And we find a barn and it's called, it actually is called the Arm Barn and it was an old cow shed with beams and everything, it looked really beautiful. And so we got to kit it out with new office furniture. The other thing I did, which again, you might say was a risk, I bought a Mercury telephone exchange with voice answering on it, which back then was very expensive. But I thought, we're going to be a global company, we're going to be, we want answers 24 hours a day, we need voicemail. So, so I spent money there. With the furniture, I want the best furniture I can get for uh, the money I've got to spend. And they got some lovely wooden furniture or some plastic furniture. So I said to the guy who's selling me the furniture, um, you really should sell me the wooden furniture at the price of the plastic furniture because in our barn you can take photographs and against the memes he'll love them, you can promote your stuff. So he agreed to do that. And then I was still short of money and I wanted a boardroom table. If he could make me a lovely wooden boardroom table, it would go with the furniture and it would look nice in his brochure. And I didn't have any, and, and we were negotiating. 
So it was toss you for the boardroom table, and I happened to win the toss, just lucky. And the, 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 uh, I'd actually decided that to start with, they didn't need drawers, they could put their books on the floor. So what I'm saying is I'd spent the money on the voicemail, but I'd said, no, you're not having drawers. And I never lost the, uh, the drawers, by the way. But it's interesting how these stories come about. So Arm was set up as a joint venture, and I was, a be I was the chief executive and chairman of a joint venture. I went to see a friend of mine called Peter Smitham, who was the chairman of Schroeder Ventures, because he knew more about ventures and startups than I did. I had a breakfast with him uh, in the SO Hotel High Wycombe, and I said, Peter, I've got this job opportunity, and here's what's going to happen. What advice would you give me? And he said to me, don't take it. Joint ventures never work. And I thought, oh my God, he's right. I said, it's too late, Peter. I've accepted the job. So from day one, there was absolutely huge pressure of being the chief executive of a joint venture. Because not, not only do your joint venture partners have a different view of what your priority is, I had two Acorn directors on my board, and I had two Apple directors on my board, and I thought, these are all from the same company, they'll all agree with each other on what should be done. What actually happened is they didn't agree at all, right? And in fact, some of them didn't like each other very much. So me naively going in there, the first phase was, how do I get a vision of where we are going and get the buy-in of everybody to achieve that vision. So after four months, I'm thinking Peter Smitham is absolutely right. There's absolutely no hope. This joint venture is never going to work. And the turning round, one of the Apple directors, really nice guy called Giancarlo Zani, who's actually Italian, but he was head of Apple France at the time. He invited me down to Paris and he took me out for some lovely food and we drank a lot of wine and I felt a lot better. Okay, that, that, so that was, a, that was a key positive moment. And then what I did is I presented to the board, here is the strategy, all of them. Do you all buy the strategy? Yes, we do. And I agreed the mechanism about what I had to take up to them and what I didn't. Now you've all approved it, let me get on with it. So that's how, that was phase one of the joint venture challenge. Phase two of the joint venture challenge was, so the original plan was always to take this company public. Everybody was paid low salaries, everybody had share options. In 1997, it was agreed by the, vo the joint venture partners that we would take the company public. They all approved it. They're all sitting on my board. And we have appointed Morgan Stanley and the lawyers, and we've spent probably close to a million dollars already on paperwork and stuff. And Acorn come back and say to me, sorry, don't, import, don't support the joint venture anymore. It's off. And they own 43% of the company, so they had the power to block it. So I then had a year of fight with my major shareholder to get the IPO back on the road. I would actually say for me personally, managing the joint venture was the hardest thing I ever did. And the joke is, going public was so easy after having run a joint venture. So, so th those were the internal pressures. On my side, the 12 founding engineers uh, basically uh, when, when I said we're going to be the global risk standard, of the 12 founders, number one, Jamie, who was the most senior, actually believed we had the chance of being the global standard. The other 11 uh, thought we'd be bankrupt within a year and they wouldn't have a future. Over time, we persuaded them. So then next thing, year one, we're halfway through, we're running out of cash. The Acorn engineers have been promised a salary rise and I present to all of them what the numbers are looking like. And Harry Meekings, head of C Compilers, said, it's obvious you can't afford to give us a salary rise. I said, yes, Harry, quite right. Um, what I promise is when we got some money, I'll give you a backdated rise. At this time, we're negotiating our first fee-paying license deal with GC Plessy. It was Plessy at the time. We got the deal. And Doug Dunn, who was the CEO of Plessy, rings me up and says, Robin, got a bit of a problem. Just been taken over, or we've just been taken over by GC. They're going to have to approve this deal. So the money that was supposed to come in in July actually came in on the 28th of December because 
GC had to reapprove everything. We had working chips before we had a contract. So, and what I would say is there, there are examples like that at every stage of every day, every week. So Tim O'Donnell rang me up, said, I'm trying to get this contract from Apple. Uh, I'm in this boardroom, they've left me locked up in here. Uh, they won't give me the purchase order. And Larry Tesla has resigned from the board, okay? Larry was told by the Apple people because he was on the arm board, he had a conflict of interest. So he had to resign to sort it out. We're doing a deal in Japan. They keep me locked up in a room for 24 hours and they're trying to negotiate a lower price. I refuse to give in. It's been a really hard day. I'm with Ishikawa San and we're going to catch the Shinkansen train back to Tokyo and the train's not running. So we have to stay in a terrible hotel. Get back to Tokyo, they phone with a purchase order. So at every step, there are issues like that every day. Okay, and it isn't, in my opinion, it's the the, the looking hindsight says this great thing happens, this is the breakthrough. The reality is it's all really hard work. I mean, the culture of the company, by the way, and it still exists today, I, I was asked by the joint venture partners, what do you want the culture of the company to be? And I said, hard work and fun. And you have to work really hard. If you're having fun, you're inspired and you do a little bit, little bit better than if you're just doing a job. So that was the, that was the culture. And it isn't one big thing. But the, the reality is there's like big crises. When Acorn wrote the solicitor's letter that the IPO was off, um, and this was like personal, you know, uh, I was the deputy, sorry, whenever I went on holiday, I appointed a deputy. The solicitor's letter arrived the day I was on holiday, deliberate by the Acorn lawyers because they knew I wouldn't see the letter. Jonathan Brooks knew I was on my boat. We opened the letter. I jump into the River Thames with my clothes on and we scrub the side of the boat down to recover. So though, and, and it's loads of those things, you know, hundreds, thousands of those things every day. That's real life. So with Arm, the 12 founders, and, and, and they had been sitting inside of Acorn and their future was uncertain because Acorn had been a very successful company with the BBC microcomputer, but with the Acorn Archimedes, uh, it, the sales weren't growing as much and there was competition from the IBM PC and all the rest of it. So the 12 founding people knew they didn't have a future in Acorn and they knew with me and the team and the vision there was some hope. On day one, Jamie got it and probably within a year, maybe half of them had got it and over time they all got it. So they. I was very, very open with them. So I didn't say, you're not going to have a salary rise. Harry Meekins, a uh, boss of C compilers, said, don't think we should have a salary rise. Good idea, Harry. So I didn't have to do any persuasion. I th and again, I believe that good leaders enable people to do great stuff, not tell them what to do or persuade them. If, you, if you're wasting all your time persuading people, it's a very inefficient use of time. And I think if you actually give people the opportunity to do what I think most individuals want to overpromise, uh, sorry, want to underpromise and overdeliver, not the opposite. They're, they're, it, presumably they're good people and not lazy, but if you enable and you take the team, so the power of the team, and, and by the way, in the middle of this fight with Acorn over not going public, I, I, my solicitor's letter back has signed by everybody in the company, go away, get real guys. I mean, I could dig the letter out, but, but, but that's what, and the power of we, you know, is a hundred times more than a few idiots in a corner somewhere. Everybody, absolutely everybody. Because I had been looked, so, so one of the things about, um, and, and people will say of me now, I have, a, I have a good vision. If you read the history books, and if you look at what's happened, you can, you can, you learn from that. Now, in my case, it wasn't history books. This was real life experience, the pain with the S2 of the EB machine not working properly, the downturns with Motorola. It's one of the things I say is progress through pain. So if I look at all the stuff I've learned, and I apply, look at where the future is going to be, and I say, from all this stuff I've learned, how can I make that future better? It's blindingly obvious what you need to do. Most people never even think about it. Never even look. They just carry on doing me too, same old way, same old way. And so I, I, don't, think, I don't think that way. And to be honest, it doesn't mean I, I didn't really feel I'm absolutely right. That, that What I actually meant is this is the only way to make this work. So if it's the only way to make this work. It's the only path I can go down. So if they're telling me all this stuff, I can't do anything about it, so ignore it. You see what I mean?
the reality is Intel was created in the year 1968. In 1968, what Intel did was absolutely spot on. ARM was created on November the 28th, 1990. That was the right thing to do. People now see to people, ARM did this, don't do that. The issue is when you start the business, you have to do what's right at the point in time when you start it and you have to have your eyes wide open and you don't have to, as I say, this rear view mirror thing, all of business studies, all of finances, um, you know, the joke, there are, there are jokes, this is what I can tell you, know, what's the definition of the finance director? He's the person who is confidently backing into the future. But the engineer is actually looking forwards and saying, where are we going? So, so uh, when you look backwards, you can come up with all these questions, but if you look forwards, think about how the world is changing and all the rest of it. But of course there's risk, everything's a risk. Intel to every startup is a risk, you know? Uh, uh, so, uh, it's, uh, 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 and, and you look at, you, you also look at mistakes, so look at, the, so by the way, when I was coming up with the business model for ARM, there were companies I looked at and studied quite deeply to see what I could learn from them in order to help the evolution of the ARM business model. There were three companies. They were Microsoft, because they created a global standard with DOS and everything. They were Nintendo, because Nintendo, making the Game Boy and so on, they had a very low cost operation. They subcontracted all the manufacturing. They were very good on the engineering, and they shipped it everywhere. And the, th and the third company was Dolby, which was a, a, another British licensing company. So in order to, so here's where I want to go. Here's the vision. Who can I learn from? Look at Dolby, look at Microsoft, look at Nintendo. Intel's business model is years out of date. Forget it. You know, look to the future. And, and that's, that's what you do. And I, I think there is a danger with people who are advising other startups today. They'll say, well, look what ARM did. And, and I would say, well, by all means, look at the good bits that ARM did that fit for you. But look at the world you're in today, not, not what was back then. Every single partner started life as a competitor because they all designed their own microprocessors. We said we are going to join the globe, we're going to create the global standard that you can use and not do it yourself. So for those engineers working on their microprocessors, we were a threat. So we'd have the chief executive who'd see the vision of ARM and what we're going to do, but he's got all these hundred engineers working on stuff that's a direct competitor to ARM. So what I would do is say, Dwight Decker, by the way, was one of the guys whose name comes to mind, Rockwell. Dwight, instead of having your 100 engineers working on this microprocessor to compete with us, get them working on a graphics engine that goes alongside the ARM to add more value to the architecture that you can win on. So, so there's a process of, it's about resource, it's about return on investment, and it's about where you deploy people, that's one thing. The other thing is we're going to create a global standard. How do you know it's a global standard? So you, you have the ARM architectural definition model and say this is the Bible of what it is. You all have to meet that spec. And then you'd have test things to check that it actually meets the spec. So you have to put in certain things that define and check what it is you've defined. Then the other piece is the patenting. When we started this company in the original business plan, we're going to be the global risk standard, we're going to be licensing, we didn't have a single patent. So the first thing we did was appoint some patent agents, put a patent for So th these are all little, little, so that, uh, this is the other thing about visionaries and detail. You've got to put, uh, I say again to the startups, you're as weak as the weakest link. If I, Arm hadn't got his patents right, we'd have failed. If we didn't have the architectural definition, we'd have failed. If we didn't have the validation suite. So you've got to do what you've got to do and you've got to work out and you've got to do them all in parallel. You can't, you can't say, well, I'll do this and I'll do that next week. You've got to look at the big picture and do everything perfectly. Same applies to a football team or a cricket team or whatever, right? It only takes one small thing to lose the game. Okay, so throughout your life... Have you uh, uh, and then the, the other thing was we preached, and this, this is what people will say of me. Robin will keep saying, we've got this partnership business model. We're going to do this. And people eventually, you know, they, they said after me... They would, they would pick up on what I said. But the thing about partnership, it is about win-win. So you're my partner, and you want this deal to help you more successful. And you're another partner, and you want this deal to help you be successful, and you'll want this, because you've all got different strengths. Partnership is about bringing your strengths to my strengths, 
and creating a, big, a better solution for both of us. And each partner is different, but you have to treat them all pair, uh, fairly. So we joke is like, right, for Samsung, they need a pound of pears. For Texas Instruments, they need a pound of apples. And for Sharp, they need a pound of bananas. But it's still a pound is a pound is a pound. And that's, that's so you've got, you've got to, and what they will, the big companies in particular, will try and negotiate a better deal. And the smaller companies, there is a danger they can't get as good a deal, but it's actually about fairness and equality and, and balance. And, and that's, I guess, kind of what I've, that's what we've done. You know, I can honestly say, hand on heart, I, I, I also say it's like your kids, right? Don't have favorites. They've all got strengths, they've all got weaknesses, they all upset you, they all make you happy. Just look at what they are and just talk about it and just and talk it through. Now, the other thing I would say, Texas Instruments as our, was the first licensee that, as a big company, had good experience of partnership. So they said, we need regular review meetings, we need to discuss it, and they, they helped us evolve my practical ideas into, uh, sorry, my, my vision into, into practical ways of doing things, by the review, by this honesty, by working together. So, so to make the partnership work, the partner has to come and play with you, and you learn from the partner as well as they learn from you. It's two-way. Nobody's ever pushed me to do anything. I don't respond very well to that. I have been invited to do lots of things in my life, and sometimes I've declined the offer. So I could have gone to Geneva, I could have gone to America. I chose not to, and the main reason why I chose not to is because it didn't fit with the family aspirations. I've also seen people, this is friends now, who've gone on the international career circuit, and quite often they end up divorced, right? So, so for me, if your family want to move, fine. So this is me, the cynical engineer. Uh, transformation looked at through the rear view mirror is something you can describe. Uh, I think there's no, I, I don't really, so a tra I don't think I am a transformational leader. If you've got a business that's going bankrupt and somebody comes in to turn it around and change direction, to me that is a transformational leader. I do think I'm some sort of visionary and I can see opportunity and I can set direction and I can help implement it. Now, what happens is the arm, um, so the reality is, let's just draw a parallel for you. So American cars used to be big and gas guzzling and then along came Japanese cars. It was obvious to me that mobile devices were going to need more processor power and it was going to they were going to need lower cost and they were going to need lower power consumption. And so I saw that ARM could fit that need. And that was a natural trend that if anybody seriously looked at it, you could just slot into. And I was fortunate enough to identify the opportunity and see what was going to happen better than other people. And I just fitted into what happened. And, and, and again, what I'd say is the world is going in a certain direction with a huge momentum. You know, N Nero didn't hold the tide back. I think, I think I, so what I'm really saying to you is I don't believe, apart from a turnaround or fixing a broken company, I don't really believe in the term transformational leadership. What I do believe is a visionary who can see the future and help get there. That, that, that to me is a more accurate description of what I did. And what I would say is if I hadn't done what I did, somebody else would have. Right, so it might have been AT&T with The Hobbit, it might have been MIPS, it might have been... Because the world has certain needs, so if you look at the problems of the world today, we're short of energy, we're short of power, we're short of food, we're short of water. I believe the resourcefulness of man is got the ability, somebody's going to fix it, right? And, and I, I don't believe that man, anybody, is that powerful. You know, nobody can be Nero, right? Now they might, when they get into their, on their soapbox, say, I'm Nero, hold the sea bike. Absolute nonsense, right? So, so I actually, uh, I, I, and again, by the way, a friend of mine is Clayton Christensen, who wrote The Innovator's Dilemma, uh, and he, his opening talk is, why do all these big companies fail? And he says, 
because of the garbage we teach at Harvard Business School, you know, and he's now a Harvard Business professor. So I actually think, open your eyes, be realistic. And it, with my startups, by the way, people say to me, what advice would you give me? I don't know if you've seen the program Silicon Valley, which is a comedy. I advise all my startups to just watch uh, Silicon Valley because you've got all the characters in there and all the, they do the SWOT analysis and everything. So I think through humor, we can learn a heck of a lot actually. And that also might help you chill out and think a bit better. So uh, Silicon Valley would be my best recommended uh, MBA text at the moment, rather than all the textbooks. Not if you've got somebody to share it with. So, so I had the vision, I sold the vision to the 12 engineers and they were, and so if, if there's nobody who has the same vision as you, so starting on, before I accepted the job, Jamie had bought into the vision. If, if Jamie hadn't bought into that, job, into that vision, I doubt if I would have taken the job. You need, it starts with two and then it can expand. And, 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 and the other thing is anybody can have a vision, just put it down, write it down, challenge it and adjust it. It's not, it's not rocket science, it's actually, well, fortunately I find it very easy. Uh, it's the, it's, it's some, it, it, one of the things that frustrates me the most is people being really stupid or dishonest. So when they are not telling, when I ask them a question and they give me a false answer, the, the, the term that Tim, uh, Tim Skor has, who's the ex-CFO of ARM, he says it's called dancing around the handbags. Everybody's dancing around the hand, handbags and nobody asks somebody to dance. That, real, that sort of environment really frustrates me and I, get, I can get irritable, I can get cross, I can get angry, I can lose my marbles and shout at people. Mm -hmm. and, but I don't really mean it, it's just that I'm very frustrated about why when things are so obvious and I've explained them and articulated, don't you get it? You know, that's, that's where my frustration comes. I need people to share my ideas with. As long as I've got one, it's fine. So one of the things I say to everybody is, what is job security? Job security is how easily can you get another job on the same salary? That's it, right? There's no guarantees in life. Life changes. You can... So basically, there was huge risk in ARM because it was badly funded. The business plan wasn't clear. It was a risk, but it looked exciting. There was a decent bunch of people, so why not give it a go? So that, that's how you look at it. And one of the things is I, I have a good family. My daughter was about 13 when we founded ARM. And I said to Katie, I'm thinking of doing this. What do you think, Katie? She says, tell you what, Dad, I've got a dice. Throw it, and if it's a six, you'll be a billionaire. I threw it, it was a six. So these little things help, right? So, but life is a risk, you know. Um, it, we're all born, we all die, we've got a journey, you know, we're all gonna die one day, and we can die happy, thinking, looking back at my life, well, I tried everything, I had some fun, it was great. Or we can die saying, oh, I wish I'd done this. It's a bit too late then, because we're all, we're all on the same path. So it's about, to me, it's about taking opportunity. And I guess one of the things about me, this is just part of my personality, um, I kind of take risks naturally. So I'll just give you another example. When we were doing a deal with Yamaha they, in Japan, as well as making electronic organs, they have leisure resorts and, and they have little sailing dinghies. So I said to Ishikawa, uh, let's take out a sailing dinghy, right? And uh, we're in the boat and he says, have you done this before? I said, no. I said, and, he, and he says, uh, have you? He said, no. I said, let's work it out. So we sail back. First time I learned to uh, uh, surf, you know, uh, sorry, um, windsurf. This is me. Um, I'm so happy that I've got up and I'm moving and there's an offshore wind and I'm suddenly miles away from shore. I think, how do I get back? Well, what actually happens is somebody comes back and says, take the sail down and swim back with it. And I swim back. So. I don't believe in taking really stupid risks. My daughter is a skydiver. That's not something I want to do personally. But what I'm saying is, if you can find a solution to the problem, it's not really a risk. And if you never try something, you never know, you never learn. We learn, you know, as kids, progress through pain, we, we learn to walk by falling over. So I, so, but what I would say is, I don't mind making a fool of myself, right? If, if I'm an idiot, you know, so I'm learning the piano at the moment, uh, and, and I ski and I fall over. I, I am not afraid 
of making a fool of myself, right? And, and again, the other thing I would say about myself is, I what well, part of the culture of art, and we actually, this, this is, these are my words, I said, I believe in the culture of brutal honesty. So I'm the chief executive, but if you think I'm an idiot, tell me, that's fine. But just be brutally honest. Don't put any fluff on it or wrap it up in cotton wool. Be brutally honest. And if I say something to you and I'm being brutally honest, and that offends you, then I will say I'm very sorry. I didn't, I didn't mean that. And I'll just tell you, this is a true story again about the start of on, just as an example. When the company was growing and we got a lot of business, I stood up in front of the whole company and said, I'm very worried about us. We're fat, dumb and happy. I got an email from a guy who said, do you know what it's like to be obese? You know, so I went, no, I did. So I went to see him, I said, I'm very sorry. I only used the words, I, and, I, and I got to understand what obesity is all about. So I learned through, by being rude, I learned more about obesity and how to behave than if I'd ignored it and just been polite. So, but, but, but I, I, and, and I want to be polite, I don't want to be rude, but worse for me is hiding the truth and not finding it and not doing the best. Oh, everything. Every exam I ever sat, um, you know, I mean, I, I, hindsight is a wonderful thing. I, th I think the benefit of hindsight is you can do things faster. So, so when you're not sure about something, you need time to work it out. So, that, so the classic is when you've promoted somebody beyond their level of competence and you really need to move them out and other people around you can see the weakness in that person and they're telling you, and because you've promoted them, you give them too much support for too long and you don't act fast enough. So, so there, are times, there are times when you're too ruthless and you wish you'd given it a bit more time and there are times when you've been too soft and you wish you, you know, so that's just part of being human, I think. Now, my view is if you if you think about this too much, you'd never do anything. You know, again, in the start of ARM, this was part of the culture, in the performance appraisal, we'll say, what mistakes have you made? And some people say, I haven't made any. So we'd say, you're not trying hard enough then, because we learn through mistakes. And I think that is another, I would say naturally in terms of our culture in the UK, the Brits are more scared to make mistakes and probably less honest about admitting they've made them. But I, I don't have that problem. I learned how to make mistakes. The Americans taught me how to make all my mistakes and I do it with a vengeance now. The time to money in tech is longer than most things. So ARM, the ARM architecture was invented four or five years before ARM, the company, was created. ARM went public eight years after it was founded, so the elapsed time there is 13 years. Funding that and keeping it going is very hard, and at the moment if you're in serious hardware sort of stuff that ARM does, venture capital money is less available for that sort of thing. Because of Facebooks and media and social media, for the venture capitalists of this world, uh, there's a faster return, perhaps with less risk. So, uh, and again, I sit on the advisory board of Amadeus, which is one of the other things I do. And actually, the bio space is a more hot space than the sort of hard tech space. Um, so, what I'd say to any tech entrepreneur is have you got a vision that can really change the world? Let's start there. And ha can you see how you can be the world's best at what you do? And if you can't, tell me how you can be the world's best at what you're going to do. Go back and do the business plan again. If you're just going to be a me too or why waste your time. So have you got a vision on how you're going to be the world's best? So one of the problems is raising the money. But if your vision is good enough and if the team are good enough and you can be the world's first, you can still do it as well as, as, well as ever you could. But it's harder. And again, in terms of raising money, people like me as angels... It's easier to get money from me, but don't come running after this video. It's easier to get money from me than going to venture capitalists. So there's always, and when ARM started, it started at the bottom of a recession, raising money was hard. So I think starting when times are tough with a good vision, you can do it. So the other thing is the, the opportunity. So if we, look at, if we look at biology and electronics and the human body and connecting and health monitoring and energy control and all these things, the opportunities 
are as big as they've ever been and if you're the world's best you can still do it but don't don't bother if you're me too just you know go and do some go and do something else and and but 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 you know we're in a period when when the economies of the world improve there'll be more venture capital available that's just that's just time and and then the other thing is i think to create a business uh, one of the problems I have with some of the startups I have, most of the people I know are very good technologically speaking, but to make a business successful, you need a powerful business partner. And in the in the UK in particular, there's a bigger shortage of battle scarred, globally aware business partners than there are anything else. Right. So, as I'm saying, Tim O'Donnell in Silicon Valley, who I had worked with before, he was critical to getting the first purchase orders from him, or Takeo Ishikawa in Japan. So he, he, that's the other thing I say to the startups is get the money from the customer. If you can solve a real problem for somebody who'll give you a purchase order that's a good company, you're on the right track.